Welcome to this tutorial on networks. In this tutorial, I'll give an overview of social ecological networks in the context of socio-environmental systems research, and why the social network's perspective is useful as well as some examples of their application in current research. I'm Lorian Jasny. I'm a computational social scientist based at the University of Exeter. I've been working with network data since my undergraduate days, and all of my graduate training was in network methods. However, I really only started to work on environmental problems during my postdoc, which by the way was at Sysenc. It was then I realized that environmental scientists and ecologists had all this cool data and cool problems, and were looking to work with social scientists who used complementary methods. As a new part of my work, and what I'll mostly talk about now, is the emerging field of social ecological networks. First, though, I'm going to talk a little bit about the history of social networks and some big concepts, like social distance, small worlds, clustering, and their application to environmental management. Then, I'll move on to recent work in the analysis of socio-ecological networks. Social networks have a long and interdisciplinary history in sociology, psychology, anthropology, graph theory, mathematics, physics, and many other fields as well for over a century now. Social scientists in particular have been interested in how to describe what is happening in the real world using these network concepts. A groundbreaking work in this area was Stanley Milgram's Small World Study, published in 1967. In this work, he selected a target of a specific individual who was a lawyer in Boston. He then used the Sears catalog, at that time it was a luxury company even though it just went bankrupt this last year, to get the names and mailing addresses of people in Nebraska, his subjects. He sent them a packet of information with the name of the target individual, that lawyer in Boston, as well as instructions asking them to mail it to the target if they knew him, and if not, to mail the information to someone they knew who might stand a better chance of knowing the target. You can see an illustration of one of these hunts through the social network demonstrated. Individuals were thus being asked to search their social network in the hopes of getting the information to this final target. The results of all of the completed chains or successful paths, the information that got back to the target, are shown here. And this image is where we get the phrase six degrees of separation, because six was the median or most common length of each completed chain. Now, there are a lot of problems with this study, and its findings are certainly not generalizable to the whole world. But the important idea illustrated is that our social networks are structured in particular ways that make certain tasks more or less doable. Setting aside any problems with this work, it certainly helped launch the field of network theory. As a side note, Milgram is probably better known for his controversial obedience experiments in which he ordered people to administer what they believe were increasingly intense shocks to people asking them to stop, who were part of his research team. In more recent work in 1998, Duncan Watts and Steve Strogatz at Cornell tried to come up with a model of networks that would give rise to these conditions that Milgram uncovered. They argued that the real world was characterized by tightly clustered or dense networks of lots of ties. This is what enabled lots of people in Boston to know the target, as well as relatively short paths from one side to the other. That's how Milgram got such short chains. The main takeaway here is that we can think about the characteristics of any empirical network and the consequences of them for different kinds of goals in the real world. Tightly clustered networks means that lots of people know each other quite well, but this is impossible to maintain with everyone when ties have some cost, so key shortcuts or paths are needed if information needs to spread from one side of the network to the other. Where these type of network structures are particularly useful for speedy information flow, they're exactly what we try and prevent when looking at disease transmission, for example. Higher fragmentation, or separation, as shown here, might be really beneficial in other types of networks with other goals.
Turning to the environmental context, we can think of networks of organizations who collaborate together on environmental projects. In partnership with the U.S. Forest Service, I helped collect data on these networks in a project called StuMap. We were interested in the community of stewardship organizations operating in urban areas. For this project, stewardship here is very broadly defined as having some kind of involvement and management of the environment. We included community gardens, youth groups that clean up the parks, as well as non-governmental organizations working on environmental issues. In the top maps, we see data collected in Philadelphia on the left and New York City on the right. Each circle, also called a node or an actor, represents the location of the home office of an organization, which either took the survey or was mentioned by another organization as a partner. The tie here, shown in black lines, represents collaboration between two organizations. The networks on the bottom are the same data, but instead of using a geographic layout, collaborating organizations are placed closer together. From these paired images, you can see first that there are geographic clusters in the top, as well as dense social clusters in the bottom images. In a recent paper, we investigated the types of network structures present in these data and how they map onto the geography of the urban area. We looked at two types of spatial relationships. First, the distance between the home offices, as well as whether the groups organized environmental activities in the exact same areas of the city. Our results showed that having home offices near each other was a far better predictor of collaboration, our network ties, than working in the same areas of the city or having overlapping turfs. In this way, we argued that we saw social motivations for collaboration, but that these were not as well fit to the ecological realities of the city. The idea of social ecological fit was introduced by Eleanor Ostrom, a remarkable woman who won the Nobel Prize for her work on common goods, natural resources. The idea, which has been expanded by many other writers, is that institutions and linkages in the social world should match the configurations found in the ecological world in order to be more effective. We argued a better fit would instead have found overlapping projects to be more predictive of a tie. In other words, if two groups worked in the same area, that a better fit would have them collaborate as well. In thinking about the StuMap project, we conceived of one sense of social ecological fit as collaborative organizational ties matching where there were spatially overlapping projects. For example, if organization A was working on site A and org B on site B, we argued it would be better fit if organizations A and B also worked together. However, our findings showed that overlapping sites was far less significant in explaining collaboration than many other social processes, like having closer home offices or working on the same kinds of projects, even if they weren't co-located. I really wouldn't necessarily call this a social ecological network, simply because the ties between our ecological nodes is just whether or not the sites overlap. We don't have any data on the sites beyond that the organizations located a project there. As a result, this is much more of a social networks project with the ecological component viewed as simply an attribute of two organizations. Do they have overlapping project sites or turfs or not? A critical question here is, what are the appropriate social and ecological ties to match up into one social ecological network? Overlapping sites, as we used, might be a proxy for some kind of ecological relationship, but we need a lot more work to uncover what kinds of relationships would really be important between the different sites in each city. Interdisciplinary network scholars are tackling this question and expanding on the idea of ecological networks and connectivity, and a new field of social ecological network analysis is slowly emerging. A landmark paper is work by Orion Bowden and Maria Tengo from Stockholm University in 2012, and is what some have called the first fully socio-ecological network. The data for this study came from a village of around 9,000 inhabitants in Madagascar. Here, the red nodes indicate different clans and where they live. The red ties are social ties of exchange of resources among the clans. The green patches are forests. The blue ties are social ecological ties, indicating that a particular clan 
harvests resources from those patches. Finally, the green ties are purely ecological ties representing the capacity for seed dispersion amongst the patch patches themselves. The different social and ecological nodes are located on the map by where the forest patches are and where most of a particular clan lives. We can think about the network abstracted from geography, which might, for some, make the concept of a social ecological network a little more clear. Fundamentally, we're talking about a set of social entities, often called nodes, actors, vertices, or even some other terminology, that have some sort of interaction. Similarly, we've got a set of ecological nodes which also have some sort of interaction or relational tie. Finally, there are also ties between the two sets. In this way, the social ecological networks can be thought of as multi-level network or a multi-level model with interactions between both the social and ecological le levels as well as within. In a recent review paper, Jesse Sales and co-authors tackled this question and developed a series of definitions and identified instances of what they called fully articulated social ecological network data. To qualify, the authors required that ecological data be considered as nodes in the network rather than just attributes of the different social entities, as in the previous study. When Sales et al. finished collecting data in late 2017, they identified only 27 papers that met this criteria, but there's been an explosion since. They then categorized the papers by aims, methods, and audience. They demonstrated that social ecological networks were part of an interdisciplinary research community and established this type of data was not only interesting, but could be used in applied contexts as well. They also showed a clear need for new methods specifically tailored for social ecological networks. Prior to this, few papers were able to use methods of statistical inference or provide outcome measures, but this has also changed greatly since this paper came out. A more recent example made me think very much of the work on small worlds. Monica Egerer and colleagues modeled social ecological connectivity amongst urban gardens in New York, as well as Chicago and Baltimore. They used data on landscape cover to model the social and ecological ties separately, and then looked at significant overlaps between the two systems as evidence of high social ecological connectivity. The map shows their simulated networks for New York City. They were able to use these data to find what they called hot and cold spots in the different cities where either social or ecological ties were far lower than expected given their data. Just as Watts and Strogatz modeled the world to include small, tightly connected clusters with some longer paths in between, this work shows a similar view of urban areas that are clustered where the authors argue ecosystem services are also better provided, but there's fragmentation or gaps in between. Going back to the Bowdoin and Tenko study on Madagascar villagers, their work showed a very different type of methodological approach to socio-ecological networks. Rather than looking at the whole network level of connectivity, like Egger et al., they looked at individual motifs or subnetworks and focused on their relationship to the theory of socio-ecological systems. A motif, sometimes called a subnetwork, is a selection of nodes and all the ties among them. It can be of any size, but frequently we're limited to those of only three or four nodes due to computational issues, although much more recent work has pushed these limits. Here are some groupings in the original Bowden and Tengo paper that looked across all different kinds of combinations of both social and ecological nodes. The motif method thinks about these kinds of smaller structures and what theoretical ideas they represent. They've separated the motifs into types based on the kinds of socio-ecological or blue ties included. They then compared the empirical counts of these motifs to the counts in a null or baseline model to talk about whether some motifs are significantly more present than we'd expect. The motifs method has become quite common in the literature on socio-ecological networks. 
Out of tons of these different motifs, more recent work has started to focus in on a few configurations that we see as mapping explicitly onto theoretical ideas of common pool resource management, as well as socio-ecological fit. Bowden and Tengo's work with clans in Madagascar has developed some of these examples. Maria Tengo writes that the forest patches are protected by cultural norms restricting access and governing usage. These patches provide essential ecosystem services, such as microclimate regulation and crop pollination, as well as having great cultural significance. She writes that, quote, the landscape has been remarkably well preserved over a substantial amount of time, despite strong pressures on land and forest resources. She argues that the ways in which the clans maintain their social and social ecological ties provide clues to why these areas are so successfully managed. In the example of clans and forests, the image on the left would indicate that the better management occurs when clans that both use the shared resources in a particular forest patch also coordinate the management together. This is the closed triangle for a common pool resource problem. Bowden and Tengo, as well as other colleagues, indeed find that the closed triangles are far more likely to occur in the Madagascar clan network than the open triangles when compared to a baseline model. Similarly, with these motifs, the triangle to the left would indicate that one clan is using resources from interlinked forests. We would hypothesize that clans in this kind of formation would minimize externalities that might arise because probably they're more aware of the linkages and potential cascading changes in the socio-ecological system. In other words, the clan will more likely manage the resources in each forest patch to prevent negative effects on the other linked ecological nodes. Whereas if they weren't connected to interlinked ecological nodes, they might not have such awareness of the system. Bowden and Tengo again found that left triangle statistically more likely than that on the right. However, in this study, they didn't have explicit examples of such awareness on the part of the clans in management, but newer research is demonstrating that these relationships and awareness on the part of social actors can exist. While these motifs were developed with a specific context in mind, Bowden argues in a 2017 paper that these kinds of ideas and motifs are extendable to other types of social and ecological ties. In particular, he cites a lot of recent work looking at trophic networks among fish and other ocean creatures at the ecological level, harvesting as the social ecological tie, and then collaboration at the social level. He argues that many of these same types of motifs are important in these other kinds of relations as well although he highlights that the choice of ties is critical for the right measurement as well as theory building. The complexities of getting this data are so large that it is very difficult frequently to directly match social actors to ecological nodes or find the right social network to complement the ecological network and vice versa. However, getting this aspect right is critical for being able to use these networks for any kind of useful end and is a topic that still needs a lot of development and thinking. Building on Bowden's work, Michelle Barnes and colleagues look at socio-ecological networks of coral reef fishing communities in Kenya and Papua New Guinea. They use knowledge sharing about fishing as the social tie among fishermen, trophic relationships, or who eats whom, as the ecological tie, and being fished or harvesting fish as the social ecological tie. The main finding that is consistent across three of the five communities in Kenya is the significant tendency in the network for closed triangles of one ecological and two social nodes. It's not that the other communities don't show this motif at all, but that in the first three, the motif is significantly more likely to form based on an analysis technique known as exponential random graph models. This technique also includes all of the other motifs in the figure as additional terms in the model. Barnes and colleagues conclude that, quote, our results suggest that when fishers, specifically those in competition with one another, communicate and cooperate over local environmental problems, 
that can improve the quality and quantity of fish on coral reefs. They link this finding to the fact that communities that exhibit these motifs also have higher percentages of pristine biomass and functional richness. In other words, far, far better ecological conditions than the communities that did not significantly exhibit the social ecological connectivity. While the authors are quick to note that this is not a causal explanation, it's an important first step towards linking social ecological motifs with outcomes. In a new article in the Annual Review of Environment and Resources, Bowden and colleagues argue that using motifs to examine social ecological networks will bring more clarity to our understanding of social ecological systems in general. They posit that the motif perspective will permit the investigation of a range of different types of relationships, and where organizations and individuals are both collaborating, as well as where there is conflict. And it will also extend theory on social ecological systems to a variety of new motifs as they picture. Importantly, Bowden and others stress the need to match the types of data, both type, ties, and nodes, across the different social ecological levels, and to ensure that the interpretations given in general to the motifs fit in the specific context of the data. They end with a call for more theory and to move beyond using social ecological networks to map out systems, but instead to think through the theoretical implications of network structures. As I hope I've shown, we're starting to see papers doing exactly that, and the future work in this area is certainly looking both promising and exciting. If we look back at the outline, we've discussed some core ideas about social network structure, which are key concepts in the social networks literature, but also have important applications for social ecological networks. We talked a bit about the social networks literature involving networks of organizations, and the fine line between this type of research and what's now considered fully socio-ecological networks. We then moved on to one of the main theories being used, that of social ecological fit, and how it's been operationalized in the network's literature often, but not always using the motifs approach. And finally, we've discussed a number of the leading articles in this new field. Thank you very much for listening to this tutorial. For more resources, you might consider the NASBERRY listserv run by the Stockholm Resilience Center. It's focused on social ecological networks and new research discussion and other opportunities are shared here. Similarly, there's the larger social networks listserv of SOCNET. While this isn't uh, specific to the social ecological domain, a number of relevant opportunities and ideas are discussed. You can also see Philip Stancichenko's video on the introduction to ecological networks, which has a lot of useful information, particularly for the ecological side of social ecological network analysis. And finally, by all means, please email me with any questions. Thanks so much. <laughs>